webinar. I'm Rick Tanner, the rector. And um, during the pandemic, we've had to switch our um, contact with our alumni and friends to virtual form. But we've discovered it's very advantageous because it allows people to participate in occasions from all around the world. So wherever you may be, you're very welcome uh, to this occasion. We're going to be recording um, uh, this event both. Uh, uh, and, and so please be, be conscious of that. Uh, we'll be having a Q&A uh, later on uh, after uh, Dr. Peters has given uh, his presentation. And for that purpose, uh, we'll be using the um, raise hands function in uh, Teams, the package we're on at the moment. If for any reason your raise hands function isn't working and you want to ask a question, uh, then you can just unmute yourself and proceed that way. But for the time being, if you would um, uh, mute yourself if you're not muted already, and um, it might also help if you turned off your video just for the moment, put it on later on uh, when we get to the question and answer. That will probably um, maximize uh, sound quality uh, for everyone. It gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce my colleague, Dr. Dexnell Peters, who's the Bennett Bosky Fellow in Atlantic History, 1700 to 1900 at Exeter. Uh, Dexnell was an undergraduate at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago, where he studied history and political science. And he subsequently was a research assistant associated with the University of the West Indies. He then went on to do his master's degree and his PhD in history at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And then he joined uh, Exeter College as a Bennett Bosky Fellow in Atlantic History in 2018. Dexnell was interested in Atlantic world history and in particularly in the cross imperial relations of the British, Spanish, French, and Dutch Greater Caribbean. And his current research project, on which he's going to be drawing this evening, makes a case for the rise of a greater Southern Caribbean region, inclusive of Venezuela and the Guianas, in the late 18th century, showing evidence for a very polyglot, cross imperial, and interconnected world. Dexnell has various publications to his credit, and he's also doing a significant amount of teaching at Exeter and more broadly in the university, as well as his research. But without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dexnell Peters to speak to us this evening on race and politics in the greater Caribbean during the revolutionary period. Over to you, Dexnell. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, introduction, uh, uh, Rick. I, uh, I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure to, to be here at Exeter as well and looking forward to interacting with the alumni community. I'm just going to share my screen here. I hope that works all right. Yes, we can see you. We Excellent. can see it. <laughs> OK, OK, great. <laughs> All right, so I'll get going. I think, um, so I, I mean, you heard a bit about the research that I do, but I figured it, it, it would probably be best to start off by talking a little bit about that research. Um, and I, so I, my main area is focusing on the greater Caribbean during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And I'm especially interested in sort of exploring the relationship between islands and mainland territories. Now I'll go a little bit more into that this, but I think to, to, uh, it, it would make sense to talk a little bit about the Greater Caribbean region just generally. Um, of course, the institution of slavery sort of provided one of the initial reasons for the conceiving of such a region. Um, uh, Charles Wagley was actually one of the first who kind of delineated a kind of plantation America, which spatially covered from midway up the coast of, of Brazil into the Guyanas, along the Caribbean coast, throughout the Caribbean itself, and into the United States. In fact, some sort of uh, limit the 
Great the Caribbean from Brazil to as much as uh, as far up as sort of Virginia or, or even uh, and so the, the key characteristic of this region was sort of marked by the prevalence of the plantation system and slavery, uh, centered mainly in the Caribbean and connected primarily to non-white labor and towards the production of key commodities such as sugar, coffee, cocoa, and uh, cotton. And as uh, two Caribbean historians uh, or, or wider Atlantic historians, uh, David Gasper and David Gekas note, you know, there was an interconnectedness about this wider region in which networks of trade and mobility of the free and the enslaved population made it possible for news to spread from one corner to another and to produce results that could clearly transcend national, linguistic and geographical boundaries. And I will talk a little bit more about that throughout the presentation. But this concept of a plantation America has since been expanded to consider other key aspects that drew the region together. So hence, we have terms like uh, the Greater Caribbean, the Circum Caribbean, the wider Caribbean, gaining quite a lot of currency today. And there are works such as Stuart Short's A Sea of, um, of Hurricanes, talking about sort of almost a kind of environmental Greater Caribbean. So there are all these sorts of, of ways. Um, uh, uh, Lara Putnam, you know, uh, sort of conceives of a sort of migra migratory Greater Caribbean, thinking about um, black Caribbean persons who travel to places like Panama to work on the Panama Canal and into the United States as well. And so seeing sort of a migratory sort of zone of interaction across the greater Caribbean. So it's now well expanded chronologically from thinking about sort of the period of slavery, but also thinking about other key themes or, or factors as well. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about my own research here. Um, uh, before I, I get into sort of the meat of the presentation, focusing on, on race and politics. And that is the development of a, uh, a, a, a greater Southern Caribbean. So I focus particularly on the island of Trinidad. You can see it circled in red here. And uh, the mainland colony of Demerara, which is part of today's Guyana, or you know what was British Guyana as well. And just to give a, a brief sense, uh, Trinidad and Demerara in the late 18th century uh, developed along a sort of similar path or trajectory. They were both fairly underdeveloped uh, by the late uh, mid to late 18th century. Um, uh, low population, no significant sort of economic development, and that process uh, sort of mushrooms quite a lot from the late 18th century into the early 19th century in the midst of sort of a period of reform. So in the, in the Trinidad's context, a Spanish colony in the midst of what was called sort of the Bourbon reform, so efforts to sort of make uh, greater use of, you know, peripheral areas of the Spanish empire. Um, and so uh, Trinidad, which was in you know, a Spanish, fairly underdeveloped Spanish colony, uh, begins to, you know, develops a sort of immigration scheme and allows for several uh, Caribbean come into the island. British take over the island. And so, uh, and it maintains a sort of pri primarily kind of Spanish and French um, population. And so very polyglot uh, uh, community. Similarly, in Demerara, Dutch uh, territory, but you know it, it's in fact been called a Greater Barbados because of the significant number of English settlers um, residing in the colony. And of course, it becomes uh, British as well at the turn of the 19th century. But it was essentially sort of an informal British colony uh, during the late 18th century. And so in some ways, what I argue is that Trinidad, which was perhaps more connected to the mainland, because being a Spanish territory more connected to Venezuela and with the incoming of these French settlers become even more integrated to the Caribbean. And then with the takeover of the, the British become more a part of the sort of British Atlantic system. Similarly in Demerara, a Dutch colony as it sort of uh, is integrated into the British empire, it becomes more, you know, almost, so today you, you consider that sort of Latin America, you would not consider Guyana. Uh, inside of uh, in that same uh, sort of region um, 
so it's more actually kind of uh, affiliated with the Caribbean. So it's almost been sort of to, to use a term from another historian, islanded, uh, and Trinidad sort of an island, but was almost sort of continental. So there's these kind of liminal spaces, so to speak. And in those ways, I felt, you know, with the rapid development during the revolutionary era, they kind of serve as key hubs that sort of uh, help to integrate the wider uh, Southern Caribbean region. Um, just to talk briefly about sort of migration uh, patterns, uh, during the uh, American Revolution, we have some movement southwards, uh, thinking about sort of British loyalists, and particularly enslaved persons who were newly freed um, and settled in places like uh, Trinidad. We know, of course, during the French and Haitian revolutions, a uh, uh, significant sort of um, rupture um, in the, the Greater Caribbean and the significant sort of patterns of, of, of movement, of migration occurring into the Southern Caribbean. It's in the same the, the, the context of that that there's this immigration scheme in Trinidad that I mentioned. And so with the, the, the Haitian Revolution um, and the wider repercussions for the region, you have a number of, of settlers from the French islands coming into Trinidad and that's serving as a key sort of push factor as well. And then in the Spanish-American Wars of Independence, you have some movement from the, the, um, the mainland into the uh, nearby Southern Caribbean islands. So there's almost a sort of clustering of, 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 uh, of migration within the Southern Caribbean. If we think about the transatlantic slave trade as well, and the fact that Trinidad and Demerara in the late 18th century are just beginning to develop as slave societies, and then they then begin to sort of take in become a, a significant port for the transatlantic slave trade as well. So again, there's a significant sort of clustering of, of migration occurring in the region. Um, just to, to talk very briefly, I mean, in, in, in slave uh, kept to track migrants coming in from Venezuela, from the mainland. And of uh, it's 1814 to 1816, it's registered there were about 1,500 persons um, traveling into Trinidad, at least that were recorded. And port officials in Trinidad recorded race in some instances of the refugees. Of the 230 instances, 49% um, were free colored, 27% were free blacks, 10% were enslaved persons, 8% were whites, and 6% were indigenous people. So a very sort of um, uh, 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 significant uh, mobile free people of color or free people of African uh, descent uh, uh, population here in the Southern Caribbean. And this is just to give a very quick sense of place of birth of, of Venezuelan refugees, um, 1814 to 1816. You see Grenada, Martinique, the, the key French connection. Uh, I want to begin by talking about um, the granting of the rights of free people of color. In, in 1791, the French National Assembly passed a decree granting full civil rights and political rights to free people of color. Uh, the decree, however, limited this status for those who were born of free fathers and mothers and met age and property requirements. Despite only ensuring the political rights of a small minority of free people of color, there was a strong negative reaction among white French colonists to the extent that by September the same year, the decree was revoked by the National Assembly. The outbreak of the massive slave revolt in August 1791 altered the views of those in metropolitan France and led to an unrestricted granting of full political rights to free men of color in March 1792 in an effort to regain control over the colony of saint Marc, present-day Haiti. It was a landmark moment after a protracted struggle against discriminatory laws throughout the 18th century. At some point in 1792, a Jamaican free colored man named Dixon drafted a petition on behalf of other free people of color on the island, requesting greater rights and privileges. <laughs> uh, this particular petition was unprecedented in that it was the first time free Jamaicans of color had taken collective political action. And similar to the reaction uh, from whites in the French Caribbean, Jamaican legislatures overwhelmingly denied the petition. Uh, they were especially concerned about the motives of the petitioners and the potential consequences to the colony if their requests were granted. The key concern for both French and British legislatures was the potential challenge to the institution of slavery. Members of the assembly noted that 
the quote, from what has happened in Saint-Domingue, we have every reason to believe that these free people of color have it in their power to lead our slaves into rebellion by false representation, end quote. The experiences of the French National Assembly decrees granting political rights to free people of color and the 1792 petition from the Jamaican men of color helped to illustrate how deeply associated colonial political institutions were with maintaining the institution of slavery in the greater Caribbean. Securing slavery meant the need to exclude all enslaved persons and even those linearly connected to them. And of course, the, the significant point I want to highlight here is in the same year that you have the granting of, of rights for free men of color in the sort of French Atlantic, in the same year you see a significant petition from Jamaican men of color asking for these same sorts of rights. And again, that goes back to what I was talking about in terms of the development of the Greater Caribbean and these sort of um, trans-imperial, you know, transnational sorts of um, a way in which you know these issues sort of transcended, transcended, sorry, you know, transnational, trans-imperial sort of boundaries uh, um, uh, in the region. And I mean, there's no specific evidence of the kind of clear connection between the two, but there's a clear sense. Um, or we can make the clear assumption that there was some significant awareness of what was happening in the neighbor, neighboring uh, colony of, uh, of, of saint Domingue from uh, Jamaica. Again, and as I've, I've highlighted, I mean, I'm going to focus today on the ways in which free people of color could sort of um, uh, engage in the political realm um, in the Greater Caribbean. And I'm focusing very specifically on examples from the French and uh, British Caribbean. And uh, just to give a quick sense, you know, as I, I mentioned, the, the, the political realm very much sort of was um, uh, crafted to exclude uh, people of, 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 of color. Uh, and a way in which in the British context, you have the, what was called these legislative assemblies or colonial assemblies, planter assemblies, where of course, it's the planters that sort of, or plantation owners or slave owners, sorry, that you know, became, you know, the, the exclusive sort of more elite class. Uh, and similarly in the uh, French uh, Caribbean, where you did not necessarily have these kind of legislative assemblies, uh, which, and these, I should mention that, you know, there was a significant amount of sort of autonomy to these uh, British colonial assemblies in ways that could very directly sort of challenge metropolitan uh, power and control. In the French Caribbean, you had these sort of, uh, there was in, in saint Domingue, sort of uh, across the French Caribbean, these high council or superior council. I mean, of course, uh, a lot of power sort of uh, remained within a, a government or as well as an attendant. You know, there was a sort of shared um, power structure um, in these colonies. But in these high councils or superior councils, they often attempted to sort of mimic the responsibilities and duties of these colonial assemblies. Um, and of course, those were fairly um, significantly sort of dominated by planters, um, uh, slave owners, who again became the sort of elites in society. In uh, issues of, of scale as well, of course, in areas where slavery was sort of less predominant in the Greater Caribbean, there was less of a kind of exclusive hold of slave owners in terms of the sort of elite class and being able to sort of control the political realm. But I'm, I'm specifically focusing on the slave societies of the British and French Caribbean. Um, so yeah, that's really just to kind of outline the way in which there was such a dominant, uh, um, uh, dominant control of the political realm by uh, plantation owners, white plantation owners, white slave owners. Um, and of course, slave owners emerge as a ruling class, and I, I can to quote a historian, Ira Berlin, who said, slavery stood at the center of the economic production and the master-slave relationship provided the model for all social relations. And he's talking about you know, the, the, the institution of slavery and its dominance in slave society, the way in which uh, plantation owners could, you know, uh, they dominated these colonial assemblies, they dominated the making of laws and the sort of policing of you know, people of, of color in these colonies. And so today I really want to focus more on ways in which people of color can sort of could sort of challenge the this the, the, the power, the authority of, of these white uh, slave owners and engage in politics in, in different ways in the region. So I'm gonna focus on two things specifically. 
which is uh, petitioning and collective action. Um, and so to think about petitions, enslaved persons, maroons, and newly freed Africans made increasing use of petitions during the revolutionary era. When new commissioners to Saint-Domingue, Paul Varel and Sontenax arrived in the colony in 1793, they issued a proclamation protecting enslaved persons from being forced to work on Sundays and reduced working hours for pregnant or nursing enslaved women. Women included in the proclamation was an invitation for enslaved persons to raise concerns about masters or managers to local officials. Shortly after, Commissioner Santanax received a petition on behalf of some enslaved persons complimenting the proclamation for having much diminished the rights of our masters pretended to have over us, end quote. Newly freed enslaved persons regularly took to petitioning their new de facto leader, Toussaint Louverture, after emancipation in saint Domingue. In 1799, for example, a group of former slaves from the parish of Petit Riviere petitioned Louverture, indicating their refusal to work until the release of a popular military commander from prison. Maroons in autonomous communities in Jamaica were also regularly in the habit of petitioning the colonial assembly. Trelawney Town Maroons, for example, petitioned the legislature in March 1792, requesting access to more land on the island. And though this particular request was denied, the assembly always considered their petitions, especially given the threat they posed to the plantation regime. I think increased, the increased use of petitioning in the Greater Caribbean was perhaps most pronounced by free people of color from the late 18th century onwards. Uh, well before then, they had already established a pattern of individuals petitioning for special privileges, typically, typically sort of reserved for whites. These individual petitions for white uh, privileges were most frequent in some of the larger colonies, such as Santa Mar and Jamaica where a large elite group of free people of color emerged. In saint Domingue, they commonly petitioned royal officials in the colony and in France. In 1783, uh, uh, Julian Raymond petitioned colonial administrators and followed up by reaching out to officials in Versailles the following year about racial discrimination faced by free people of color. Free Jamaicans of color also petitioned the island legislator for exceptions. And I think they, 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 in the case of sort of earlier 18th century petitions in Jamaica, it would sort of be, they would petition the colonial assemblies, it would be done on behalf of individuals, um, it would enter the colonial assembly as sort of, as private bills. Um, and it would be sort of for specific privileges for individual free people of color. And they often had to sort of petition um, uh, continually for different privileges. So it meant one individual sort of making multiple petitions over time to gain additional sort of exceptions. Um, there was heavy reluctance to grant these bills and only 128 of them passed the legislature throughout the 18th century. Only four of these bills provided the petitioners full rights of white men, including the right to vote and to hold public office. I think in the, the, the aftermath of the American and French Revolution inspired a dramatic optic in the use of petitions by free people of color as well. Those that served in some military capacity also felt motivated to seek increased civil rights and greater inclusion in political institutions. The French National Assembly's Declaration of the Rights of Man also ushered in an increased flurry of petitioning among free people of color as they pressed to also be provided with newly declared rights. Their request to the National Assembly eventually met success, as I noted earlier, in 1792. And again, in the same year, we have uh, free Jamaicans of color petitioning for the right uh, to vote there. Uh, the success of the free people of color in the Francophone Atlantic, Francophone Atlantic not only influenced those in Jamaica, but across the, 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 the Greater Caribbean. Uh, between 1799 and 1814, seven petitions were submitted by free people of color to the Legislative Assembly and the governor in the British colony of Barbados in a clear struggle for civil rights. The first was signed by 58 persons. Another in 1803 included almost 300 petitioners. Several other British colonies witnessed increased mass petitioning from free people of color in the early 19th century. And it goes on beyond the sort of the, the, the French and the British, Greater Caribbean, the Danish uh, uh, Caribbean as well, 
resource would have been increasing use of these uh, petitions by free people of color. Uh, the numbers were perhaps most pronounced in Jamaica. In 1813, a petition, a petition making similar requests to the one in 1792 was signed by over 2,400 uh, people of color. And while legislators granted some concessions, they were still unwilling to provide any political rights to the people of color. The civil rights movement, therefore, continued to progress with great momentum. In 1823, three Jamaicans of color organized the first island-wide petition for improved rights, including the right to vote in elections. Some 3,000 persons signed the petition. And it was once again rejected, but widespread mobilization certainly empowered uh, these people. One of the key changes with this petition was also the extent to which its support now went beyond elite free men of color. Uh, so one Jamaican assemblyman smugly noted that those who signed the petition were, I quote, of the lowest class, uneducated and uncivilized, end quote. Petitions emerged even among non-whites in the French Caribbean, especially as in the Napoleonic era, so the thinking about the, you know, the, 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 the early 19th century, ushered uh, the repealing of rights previously granted to them. Uh, so as we know, uh, as you may be aware, you know, uh, there was the granting of rights for free men of color, there was the emancipation of slavery, but with the you know, rise of Napoleon, those, uh, um, were, uh, those rights were sort of rescinded and uh, slavery reimposed. Uh, and so that meant that, you know, uh, free people of color in the French colonies, uh, Martinique and Guadeloupe, had to continue their, their efforts towards gaining full political rights. And as a result, major petition campaigns uh, from, from free people of color clamoring for equal rights emerged in the 1810s, 1820s, and 1830s. So we see a, fair, a fairly sort of parallel process occurring across the British and French created Caribbean, and I mentioned even the Danish Caribbean as well. Um, so with that, I'll move on to thinking, talking about sort of collective action, because I think inevitably sort of popular petitioning went hand in hand with the development of groups, uh, societies, associations, or clubs that sought to influence colonial politics. Uh, free people of color, they, they established these sorts of um, associations. So Julian Raymond, who I mentioned earlier, he founded this, uh, with, uh, 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 along with other Sandemar, um, pe people of color from Sandemar, founded the Society of American Colonists, um, and they sort of lobbied the French government for equal rights and representation in the National Assembly. And they even connected with other organizations, um, uh, Club Messiac, which was a, a, a group of, um, of, of, of French planters, or those with associations to the colonies. Um, as well as, uh, well, that was sort of an unsuccessful um, reaching out, but more successfully, they connected with the Friends of the Black, um, the Blacks, a sort of anti-slavery society. And the growing petition campaigns across the Greater Caribbean in the early 19th century seemed to highlight the beginning of a more formalized organization among free people of color. Uh, in 1823, for example, you know, I talked about that island-wide petition in Jamaica, that was established on the foundation of a sort of committee of correspondents who then, you know, um, sent out circulars to spread information and solicit views of people. And they also organized public gatherings across several parishes in Jamaica. The results of these efforts was a petition that now not only represented the wishes of a wider cross-section of people of color, but also made more sophisticated arguments for equal rights. As a more established group, uh, they sought to extend their efforts beyond the local context of Jamaica. So first, they appointed a, a agent, an Englishman, Mac Michael Hanley, to serve um, in the, the colonial office in London. They were somewhat unsatisfied by his progress, and so they next sought to establish stronger connections with the anti-slavery movement and to gain support to help raise their issues with Parliament. And similar developments occurred in the French Caribbean less than a decade later. In the wake of the, the, the July Revolution of 1830, the French government permitted the establishment of societies among free people of color. As a result, committees were swiftly created in Martinique and Guadeloupe, and these groups were remarkably political in nature. They essentially elected their own leaders, arguing that free people of color 
had not been allowed to participate in colonial affairs by white officials and that their colonial uh, delegates were ill-suited to represent them in Paris. The new representatives lobbied support from liberal French politicians and published several pamphlets and newspaper articles to gain broader support. And similar to the British context, these committees became increasingly aligned with the French anti-slavery movement. It seems there was a gradual convergence of the anti-slavery and free people of color equal rights movement as emancipation approached in the British and French Atlantic. Colonial and local officials purposely excluded enslaved persons from the political realm, yet their efforts were not always successful. Uh, historian Hilary Beckles you know, argues that enslaved persons consistently resisted the control of those seeking to enforce slavery, and that sort of indicates their preservation of their humanity and the establishment of social rights and a quest for civil liberties. Indeed, enslaved Africans could help shape politics or craft their own systems through various forms of resistance. Grand marinage, which led to the existence of large independent communities, I, I mentioned of, of the, about the Maroons of Jamaica earlier, they kind of provide a, an illustrative example of the way in which, you know, the, 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 the different or separate political worlds could be crafted within the Caribbean. Um, the Maroons of Jamaica signed a formal treaty with the colonial government, securing their freedom to exist in autonomous communities with their own political systems. The ability of these communities to negotiate with colonial authority is a powerful expression of the ways in which enslaved persons can engage with the political system. The threat of these communities posed to the stability of the plantation regime ensured that whenever they made petitions to the Jamaican assembly, their concerns were always considered, as I mentioned earlier. Indeed, slave revolts as well could be considered as uh, important efforts of the enslaved uh, to participate in politics. Studies on the revolts of the late 18th and early 19th century reveal the extent to which enslaved persons were aware of local and metropolitan deliberations about the institution of slavery. In 1789, there was an attempted rebellion in Martinique as slaves claimed the government in France abolished slavery, but local planters were preventing the governor from implementing the decree. We know that in the, the Haitian Revolution, for example, the 1791 slave uprising, there were rumors about further reforms to slavery, including uh, extra days off a week from the king. There were three major slave revolts in the early 19th century in the British Caribbean that were all tied to key deliberations about reform and the abolition of slavery. So in 1831, for example, Samuel Sharp, who was well aware of discussions in Britain, believed that the king and the British people were in favor of slave emancipation. As a result, he encouraged enslaved persons to engage in mass strike action to secure their freedom. But this eventually steamrolled into one of the largest slave uprisings in the British Caribbean. Similarly, when French colonial officials delayed the implementation of emancipation in 1848, over 20,000 slaves revolted in Martinique. The provisional governor of the colony responded swiftly by immediately proclaiming emancipation the following day. The collective action of enslaved persons could therefore significantly influence colonial politics. So uh, in conclusion, uh, I think petitioning and collective action were two tools that people of African descent used to provide a formidable challenge to the efforts primarily of white colonial elites to claim exclusive control of the political realm. Despite persistent challenges by people of African descent, colonial societies grounded in systemic racism continued to establish new ways of maintaining racial hierarchies. So while a few prominent men of color began to enter colonial assemblies, the majority of this group and later the former enslaved persons were largely restricted from access to colonial assemblies. Colonial elites implemented several strategies, including maintaining high minimum property requirements, and in the extreme case of the British Caribbean, disbanding the assemblies entirely to drastically prevent growing black participation in these political institutions. The increased numbers of free people of African descent beginning to be elected in the Jamaican colonial assembly since the 1830s was met with great alarm by planters and colonial officials. In 1865, a protest erupted against injustice, widespread poverty, and high poll taxes that restricted many people of African descent from voting. And this led to a major rebellion known as the Moran Bay Rebellion. 
In the aftermath, the Jamaican Assembly disbanded itself with the encouragement from colonial officials. The road to emancipation established important political rights for non-whites. However, as I noted, continued property qualifications for voters ensure that most people of African descent were excluded from elections. <laughs> this only changed somewhat with the granting of universal male suffrage as a result of the French Revolution of 1848 and later universal adult suffrage in the early 20th centuries across the British and French Caribbean. <clears throat> I think along the way, clear strategies of people of African descent to engage with and shape local uh, regional politics continue to develop across the Greater Caribbean. And we know a bit about some of these developments on the national or imperial boundaries. So this sort of comparative way of looking at the movement of uh, the petitions movement, for example, still needs more research uh, to be done and kind of trying to flesh out the broader kind of regional connections or movements in kind of pan-Caribbean context. And so that's some of what I'm trying to do inside of this research. But most importantly, as I've, I've outlined, um, you know, the, the attempts of white, uh, elite white slave owners in these plantation societies to sort of maintain exclusive hold of the political realm and to show ways in which people of African descent, not just free people of color, but enslaved persons as well, were able to sort of engage in politics in different ways, mainly here through the use of petitions and thinking about sort of collective action in a sort of broader uh, conceptual way. Uh, with that, I'll leave it there and open up the, the floor to any questions uh, or, yeah, comments, anything that you have. I'm, I'm happy to receive them all. So thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you well, thank very you. much, Dexel, for that um uh, amazing uh, view of uh, such a wide variety of different uh, places and events and movements. I think you've set us up very well for the question and answer period. So may I invite uh, questions from those of us who are assembled? I've got a question from Ian Sanderson. Would you unmute yourself and please put it to Dexno? Hello, that was a brilliant talk. Thank you very much. You make a Caribbean uh, ideas moving about, um, but there are some parts of the Caribbean which were very slow to move. I'm thinking about Northern Brazil and Cuba. Is that because these areas had um, very strong um, white settlers that suppressed ideas, or was it? Did the ideas never reach those kinds of places? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for that question. And when when you say sort of slow to move, meaning in terms of you know the the kind of um, civil I, rights movement. Yes, that's what I mean. Yes, between freedom and people of color having um, better rights than they used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will admit that I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps a little more aware of the kind of French and, 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 and British context then. Um, but again, in, in terms of, uh, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that they were sort of slower to move per se. If I draw on the kind of thinking about the slavery votes, for example, as kind of being a way of participating in politics, we know of the that they, uh, as a result of the Haitian Revolution, you have the, the impact of uh, um, 1812, uh, a Ponte uh, revolt that occurs in, in, in nearby Cuba. And then there's even the sort of 1835 Mali revolt in, in Brazil as well. And so while you, you might be right in talking about sort of some of these uh, revolts in that way occurring somewhat later um, in the sort of early 19th century, I think that the, the connections definitely do exist. and. Of those two particular results I mentioned, historians mention a clear link to the, the Haitian Revolution. And so there is this way in which, um, no doubt, Cuba and Brazil are certainly part of this sort of greater Caribbean, wider, interactive or integrated sort of um, uh, region, so to speak. So I wouldn't necessarily say that they were potentially slow. I, I, um, it, it might be, there might be something to connect in terms of the um, the immediate impact of the French and Haitian Revolution in the British in the French context, and the immediate impact of a greater rise of public uh, 
anti-slavery sentiment in the British context, perhaps leading more towards uh, uh, you know, a more rampant or vibrant movement um, in the British and French, as opposed to uh, in Cuba and Brazil, where we know, you know there's this development, as historians say, second slavery occurring throughout the kind of 19th century. So that might be one, one point that um, speaks to the issues that you're raising there. But I think it's a, it's a good question. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Uh, I don't see another hand. Perhaps I could ask a question, Dexel. Well, I noticed that one of your illustrations um, about free people of color was of women. What was the gender dimension to either within free people of color or more generally in terms of the sort of rise of opposition to um, white domination and to the slavery regime? Yeah, thank you very much for that, but, uh, Richard. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, there's a, a lot that I could talk to in terms of that, but I'll, I'll kind of cue it down to just a few examples. I mean, there is this sort of element of it being a very sort of um, uh, a, a male sort of led uh, uh, of movement, again, going right back to the Declaration of the Rights of, of, of Men. Uh, of man and the fact that you know you have that being challenged in the, in, in the current context with the Declaration of the Rights of Women, but it very much sort of being conceived as rights for political men, um, um, political rights for men, and in the same way that you have um, you know rights, political rights being given to free men of color, and in the same way you have sort of um, free colored men in Jamaica sort of rising up and petitioning the Legislative Assembly. And so there's an element of it in terms of a gender, very much sort of a sort of male influence movement in that regard in terms of thinking about petitioning. I mean, I, I think in terms of uh, the role of women in particular, there may be some more sort of informal ways that they were involved. But I think certainly if I think about the enslaved persons, there are there is a, 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 a some scholarship focused not only in the Haitian Revolution, but thinking about other revolts where you do have a uh, uh, enslaved women being sort of more of a kind of dominant influence or a presence or perhaps them being even more um, uh, prone to uh, more sort of aggressive or confrontational uh, resistance as well. I think the, the picture that you might be talking about is Nanny of the Maroons, who sort of emerged as a, a leader among the, the uh, a Maroon community in Jamaica as well. And so I think, yeah, I think there's a there's a lot to explore in terms of the kind of gender gender dimension of uh, enslaved resistance, but also just thinking about sort of the the movement of people of African descent to sort of uh, engage in politics and resist the, the sort of um, discriminatory and, and yeah oppressive sort of systems in place. I think that's a it's an important di direction uh, dimension to to consider, and one that I probably should have given more attention to uh, in this talk as well. Thank you for that. We have a question from Jasmine Carr. Um, am, I, am I audible? Yes, you are. Um, good, e good afternoon, mm. Professor. So I am a student from India and I enjoyed your presentation a lot. And because I belong to a country who was colonized by the British for 200 years, I could draw a lot of common um, things, especially when you talked about the planters. So I had three questions and I'm sorry because they're too much. Uh, so the first thing was, I would like to know about what was the literacy level at that time? Because in India, we noticed that petitions was somehow not possible because people were um, hugely illiterate. And it was only after Gandhi came in and spread literacy that petitions was possible against the British. And my second question would be that I wondered in 19, 1823, you mentioned that there was an island wide petition in Jamaica where also the lower classes were included. So I would be really interested to know why the lower classes were included so late or why the petition started with the higher classes and then spread to the lower classes. Because here in India, it actually started with the grassroots level and then slowly, slowly it included the higher classes. And my last question would definitely be whether there was this one all emerging leader if you look at all those mass mobilizations because if we talk about the Indian independence struggle we see the name of Mahatma Gandhi coming up as one of the messiah of, of leading the people so is there anyone in the Caribbean of a person who is associated with being this leader and the path sure of all those people of color mm -hmm. 
Those are excellent questions, uh, Jasmine, by the way. Um, I think and it's, it's really interesting to kind of draw these parallels and thinking about sort of the Indian context as well. Um, I'll try to answer your questions in turn as, as best as possible. And, and I mean, I think the, the questions kind of leave room for a, a lot more consideration as well on my part. But in terms of thinking about sort of literacy level, I mean, obviously, I, I think it, it, um, you're not going to get any sort of very clear evidence of that per se, but I can give sort of a, a, a general sort of overview. For one, I think literacy levels are among sort of people of, of, of color, certainly among these kind of more elite uh, free people of color, um, it would certainly be sort of a very high level of literacy. When we go down from that level, essentially, um, I think you, you, you're entering into a realm of, of excessively, ex exceedingly less literacy. I think one thing that we can think about is you know the uh, uh, in the late 18th century there was this policy of amelioration, seeking to improve the conditions of enslaved persons and people of color, and uh, part of that included the incoming of missionaries who uh, helped to influence a sort of increase in 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 literacy over time. But uh, to, to your key point about literacy and the connection to sort of petitions, you did not necessarily have to be able to read or write to participate in petitioning because one of the ways and this was included for you know a lot of people within sort of colonial society you could hire a writer or a lawyer to write these petitions for you who would then sort of <clears throat> take uh, heed of you know sort of orally um, take note of what you were trying to sort of um, convey in these petitions and then write it up for you and so that meant a wider set of people could actually involve um, engage in this um, activity of petitioning and that was sort of uh, related to for uh, thinking about sort of um, the southern Caribbean and or Grenada for example which you know became a British colony but include several included several French Catholics who were trying to sort of consider their position within the British Empire you know and, and so they made a significant use of, of petitioning but of course there are all these language barriers as well and so the importance of these lawyers or writers who could sort of help, um, you know, write these petitions for people who may not be able to, may not have been able to do so, um, allowed petitioning to be used on a kind of wider scale as well. One of the things I think I, I can't remember if I mentioned it, but um, in the petition to um, to to sell a matoir, it was actually a, a, a Haitian Creole document. And I think it's it, there's this is one evidence of one of the very few Haitian Creole sort of primary sources that exist in in the period, or, or, and particularly as, as relates to a kind of petition. Um, so in those ways, I think uh, thinking about sort of language barriers, thinking about how other persons could you know um, give a wider sort of non-literate population access to petitioning, and thinking about the the, the use of petitioning in other languages and thinking of sort of Haitian Creole. So I think that's a, a good question. I hope I've, I've answered, um, provided some greater clarity on that there. 1823 and thinking about, you know, why the lower classes were sort of ex uh, included so late. I think that's a good question. Um, I think as I, I, I mentioned from like sort of the earlier on, you know, especially early in the 18th century, you have um, these very individual cases you know, from elite free people of color seeking individual privileges. Julian Raymar, for example, who is a very um, popular figure. Um, um, and again, you would, I mean, that probably relates to your last question, trying to think about some of the, the major persons involved. But he was very concerned only with a very my, uh, sig, um, small number, of gaining privileges for a small number, of perhaps sort of lighter skinned, more privileged or elite um, or more economically sort of wealthy persons in saint Demar, And that, you know, his initial petition sort of eventually sort of spiral out to including more and more um, free people of African descent. So I think that it, it very much starts as a more um, in this way. And I think what I should note is the gradual connection between the rights of these sort of more privileged free people of color and the anti-slavery movement. That becomes integrated even more later on in the early 19th century. When that is not integrated, you know, um, people like Julian Ramart were not concerned with the rights generally of free people of color or people of African descent generally. They were not concerned with um, the anti-slavery movement. They were not concerned with uh, improving the conditions 
of enslaved persons. I, I mean, I don't want to make a blanket statement in that way, but you know, these initial petitions from them in the late 18th century were not concerned with, um, you know. In fact, there was the the sense in which, you know, if you align with the you know the concerns of enslaved persons or this the, the concerns against the institution of slavery, that it would sort of undermine the request for free people of color to to gain rights, because then you know the next step is that they would sort of inspire the slaves to revolt or to challenge the system, you know, and it would sort of help to cause the dismantling of the plantation regime. So I think in, in that sense, there was a significant disconnect with the motives or the, the goals or the aims of the this this movement in the late 18th century. And I think only when, you know, those, uh, so I talked about in the Napoleonic era, for example, where, you know, a lot of those rights that were gained in 1792 were sort of rescinded and the difficulties that these more privileged or, you know, even sort of middle, middling group of free people of color and the way in which they saw that they were constantly sort of challenged. And I think over time with the coming of emancipation or, you know, the, the, the rise of the, that, that the debate more and more, they felt that they may better be able to kind of gain rights and privileges if they align with this kind of anti-slavery movement. You know, that became increasingly clear that they needed to sort of partner with that movement to, to gain some of the privileges, privileges they were seeking. So I hope that sort of explains a little bit in terms of why, I, I, at least I see this connection between the sort of more higher classes and, and, and lower uh, classes of, of people of African descent, um, that, low, that later stage in which it was sort of integrated. And then the emergence of, of, of leaders, I mean, Again, if I think broadly about slave revolts and so on, we, we have to include people like Toussaint Lavatoire and um, um, Dessalines and so on. And there's several other, in thinking about sort of the Haitian Revolution context, Julien Raymond um, uh, can be included in the French um, side of things with the free people of color. Vincent Auger is another one who actually led a, a, a revolt of, of people of color in, in saint -Demain. And there are all sorts of other names. I mean, I think. The interesting thing that I need to, more research needs to be done is you may have lots of individual names across in specific territories. So I, I'm mentioning in sort of the saint Demar context, you know, in Trinidad, there's sort of jean Baptiste Phillips is another one. Um, there's another person, William Dowden, who was born in Barbados. And there are lots of, of names I can give across different territories. Um, but the, the extent to which there was sort of um, a larger individuals that we can speak about on a kind of regional level. I'm not sure that's that's something that I can speak to. Um, and certainly there needs to be more research as to, you know, the influence of, so William Dowden, for example, not only operated in the context of Barbados, but tried to um, uh, try to operate across the, the Eastern Caribbean. In fact, I think he petitioned the president of the United States at some point in the late 18th century on behalf of, of free people of color. Um, in the region. So he may be one example of this sort of wider um, regional um, efforts, so to speak. But I think a lot of it is sort of focused on individual territories or, or colonies. So yeah, great questions. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you have any other follow-ups on that. Thank you so much. Um, I actually had a follow-up question. <laughs> Um, you mentioned about uh, literacy and you talked about missionaries. So did they also have some religious purpose of coming, like some undermining religious conversion rather than just spreading literacy? So was there also some religious movement going on when missionaries came to spread literacy? Yes, so of course. So I, I mentioned this process of um, slave amelioration, which in part was almost a challenge to the rise of anti-slavery sentiments in the eight, late 18th century. Um, and, you know, first coming forth from planters who were, you know, they, some people talk about sort of enlightened planters who were attempting to improve the conditions of slavery um, and, uh, and challenge this sort of, um, almost a kind of pro-slavery lobby emerging against the kind of anti-slavery lobby. A part, as a part of that process of slave remediation and the improving conditions of enslaved persons, was sort of uh, converting them to, to Christianity. Um, and in part, you can see missionaries coming in alongside to, to help in that kind of amelioration process. So the initial effort was not for, for literacy. It was to um, convert the enslaved persons. And that only begins to pick up in the late 18th century in any significant way, because you know missionary societies 
prior to that, or, or I guess um, religious bodies, so to speak, um, were more concerned with you know the 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 well the welfare or the well being of uh, white the white communities in, in the colonies, and in the British context at least, you know these missionaries pick up a lot more in the late 18th century, um, and yes, yeah, very much concerned with uh, converting up in enslaved persons. As an aside, or I guess as a as an additional add-on effect, literacy sort of would begin to uh, improve as you you know enslave persons you know reading scripture and so on and teaching them, instructing them, um, giving religious instruction as a part of that. You know you have the increased rates of literacy again, not to any significant scale. I think that that picks up even more later in the uh, 19th century because these missionaries also are responsible for establishing the first sets of schools for you know people of color as well. And so but that that's a process that picks up even more in the 19th century in particular. Yeah, we're coming up to the the hour now, but I wonder if um, somebody. Uh, else has a question they would like to put before we finish, perhaps the last question. Well, I'll fall back on the, the, the role of the chair then, uh, Dexel. I wonder if uh, you, you've shown this influence among different um, uh, anti-slavery communities in, in the Caribbean. Was there also influence among the pro-slavery forces, among the, these different uh, uh, colonial groups, of uh, the people attempting to preserve the status quo? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a, that's a, 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 very, a really excellent uh, question, Derek. Um, certainly, because uh, you have, uh, with the late 18th century and the rise of these um, yeah, anti-slavery bodies. So I mentioned the societies of the Friends of Blacks um, um, in both the French and the, the British context. And I, I mean, I, I'm not sure the extent to which you have, you know, you you, know, um, you do have these similar bodies. So I think I mentioned in the presentation Club Misiak, uh, which was sort of a, 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 an organization of those with interest in the colonies, um, French planters, merchants, um, uh, that was established in, uh, in in French metropole, and so you have these kind of trans transatlantic organizations emerging um, there. Um, I'm thinking about this sort of um, in the in the British context. You do have the uh, the the West India Lobby. There's a more formal name for it, the Committee for West Indian Plant Planters and Merchants, or as a, but generally sort of called the West India Lobby. And the interesting thing is, they sort of were an informal lobby earlier in the um, earlier prior to the late 18th century. Only in the late 18th century, from the sort of 1770s, particularly in the 1780s as well, do they formally establish themselves. You know, um, as you know, more than just going beyond the kind of informal connections, but to deliberately sort of counter the efforts of anti-slavery societies, and they begin to raise funds and you know deliberately target in a really significant way. You know, there's a book um, on it that's uh, by Paula Dumas called "Pro Pro Slavery Britain," uh, really outlining the way in which this kind of pro-slavery lobby operated in different ways and. Beyond these sort of organizations is the, the wider way in which they sort to engage with um, uh, the public. So through, you know, uh, we know of all the famous sort of Wilberforce and the, and the way in which they kind of use imagery and the, the arts and, you know, poetry and sounds. The pro-slavery lobby also did the same thing, you know, entering into this kind of wider public sphere uh, <clears throat> to not only sort of lobby you know, uh, parliament or, you know, legislators, politicians, but to enter into the, the wider um, uh, realm of, the, uh, of, 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 of public opinion. You know, the court of public opinion, I think, was quite significant. And then, uh, interestingly, in, in, in the Caribbean as well, you know, you have these sorts of, you know, what would have been these more informal gentlemen's clubs or these sorts of societies that uh, developed across these colonies that were essentially informal groups to discuss um, the interests of planters as well. And so if ever you have um, a t you know, the um, inroads being made by those in support of anti-slavery, 
you know, these uh, groups of planters who organize themselves either in these sort of societies, gentlemen clubs, you know, um, Freemason societies, etc. And they would collectively sort of gather and petition colonial assemblies or collectively gather to push back against these, you know, um, efforts. Um, and so they were making increasing use of petitioning. They were making increasing use of collective action as well. And so, I mean, I, I focused on this presentation very significantly on people of color, but um, yeah, there is a, a similar or parallel development occurring in, in opposition to, to all these developments. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Dexel, not, not just for the answer to that question, but for your answers to all the questions and for your paper. You really have covered a very wide variety of themes and countries and periods and social groups. Uh, and have given many of us who you know very little about your subject uh, a wonderful sort of bird's eye view of the major forces for change uh, in the period. Uh, we're very grateful indeed to you. In, uh, I'm very grateful also to everyone who's attended and to uh, Dexel, to your and my colleague, uh, Amelia Cross, our alumni relations officer who has brought everything together uh, for us all. So thanks to everyone, a big thanks to Amelia, but above all, uh, thanks to you, Dexnell, for a, a really scintillating performance, which I'm sure everyone who's attended has, has gained a lot from. I know I have. Thank, Thank you, you very much, and good evening to everyone. Thank you.